Ring, along with Speedway historian Donald Davidson. Welcome to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum and another edition of Indy 500, the classics. Well, Donald, today, 1965, uh, the roadsters are all but gone and the rear engine cars are beginning to take over. Yeah, there's a few left. Uh, the Europeans are coming over en masse and drivers like A.J. Foyt and Parnelli Jones are in rear engine cars and other drivers like Don Branson are in them, but they don't like them. Let's roll back the years to 1965. It's the month of May at the Brickyard. On opening day, Sam Hanks renews his friendship with the race car in which both he and Jimmy Bryan won the 500 in successive years. Speedway owner Tony Holman hands the track over to Chief Steward Harlan Fengler. And Len Sutton is first out on the track. But the color of opening day soon gives way to the serious business of getting ready to run a speed classic which has no equal. Rookie drivers, like new schoolboys, are put through their paces under the watch of officials, mechanics, and other drivers. There is room here for only the best. For those who drive this track at 160 miles an hour, rides a fine, thin line of disaster. Speed's climb. Too fast and too early in the month for Harlan Fengler, who tries to slow down A.J. Foyt. But the wall in the backstretch has the last word. Foyt's car is bent. The lightweight metal of a rear hub carrier gives way under strain. Harnelly Jones loses a wheel. The threads and a wing nut are stripped. Is the trend toward lightweight metals creating a danger factor for the drivers? These questions and others must be answered by the man who stands with his foot on the wall, the racing mechanic. But the key to speed is sometimes elusive. Roger Ward and A.J. Watson have a problem, a sick engine and a car that will not handle. Andy Granatelli listens for the song of the Novi engine, but the music ends abruptly in turn one. dream of winning is a little farther out of reach for Bobby Unser. The problems on Ward's car are dealt with in Gasoline Alley. Leader car team mechanics search for mechanical perfection, and Roger Ward waits. Finally, Jones has found the right combination. So has Mario Andretti. And A.J. Ford is running as though he never had a problem. Bobby Unser's no buy is on the track again, and he continues his search for the short way around. Ebrose spins, and with no place to go, Unser hits him square on. Both drivers are okay, but scratch two cars from the 500. Jim Hurtabees hits the wall on turn four. The car flies apart from the bone-jarring impact, but Hurtabees is only shaken up. There should have been a fire, but there wasn't. The threat of fire is always present in high-speed driving accidents, but the answer lies in a newly developed elastic rubber fuel cell, which will give on impact without rupturing. Roger Ward sits on the pit wall as A.J. Watson still tries to solve the riddle of the missing speed combination. It's qualifying day, and 1963 500 winner Parnelli Jones is ready. Four expertly driven laps give him an average of 158.625. J.C. Agajanian runs to congratulate him. Parnelli has his spot for the race. Veteran drivers and rookies alike get their qualifying instruction from Harlan Fengler. Mario Andretti listens, then wheels onto the track. His effortless performance amazes the fans. Seldom has a rookie made himself so much at home on this track. With one high lap of 159 miles per hour, Andretti's average speed of 158.849 is a new track record, 
and for the moment at least, he holds the pole position. But Jim Clark also has his eye on the pole. He won it last year, but went out during the race with collapsed suspension. plus mile per hour bracket his average speed of 160.729 miles per hour is another new indianapolis qualifying record and it looks like clark will repeat his performance of last year but the day is not over yet two-time winner aj point is on the track and running he takes the checkered flag and the speed is another new qualifying record of 161.233 Mechanic George Bignotti shares the honors with A.J. for a job well done. Track conditions are bad on Sunday. Don Branson makes the field as his grandson watches from the stands. But teammate Ward's car is pushed back to Gasoline Alley with others to wait for the second week and a new chance. Now the search for the short way around intensifies. There are just 12 starting positions left and twice that many hopefuls. Carnelly Jones makes a check run at high speed. <laughs> Suddenly, he's in trouble. The irony of it all, to have a place already assured in the 500 and a damaged car, almost beyond help. His crew must work long hours to repair the damage before race day. Further up Gasoline Alley, another race driver's hopes and dreams are represented by a pile of junk. But on the second weekend of qualifying, the powerful song of the Novi engine is heard. Jim Herdebees has a way with these temperamental cars, and he makes the field with a speed just under 157 miles per hour. It seems that the harder he tries, the worse it gets. Roger Ward points out in a very direct way that his car won't handle, and there's only one more day to go. In the stands, the mother of the racing Unser family looks down on her famous brood. Rookie Al Unser is qualified. So is Bobby. Louie turns the wrenches, and Dad offers advice. Just a few minutes before the end of qualification, Roger Ward takes his last chance. His crew has worked all night to repair the damage, and his attempt is tinged with desperation. The heart of the crowd goes out to him as he tries to coax more speed from his jinxed racer. Flag falls. And Ward pulls in. The officials get the time. 153.623 miles per hour. Not good enough. Stunned. Roger Ward sits in his car. He can't believe what has happened. Bill Cheeseburg, the slowest qualifier, happily welcomes the six o'clock gun. So Donald, two of the legendary names here, uh, Jimmy Clark and A.J. Foyt, battle for the, for the pole. Well, Foyt is on the pole for the race, but we're missing a very big name for this. Yeah, race. Roger Ward, I think that's one of the most stunning things since uh, in all my years at the, at the track. Uh, the fact that he had finished in the top four six years in a row and then was the first alternate in 1965. And there was all kinds of rumors about, well, will he start? Will they give him a provisional? No, it's the fastest 33 qualifiers, and Roger Ward watched the race on race day. So tradition rules at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1965. Time now to drop the green flag on the race. in a collar to try on a new pair of goggles to listen to the advice of the mechanic and then the time is all gone 
The moment for which they have been preparing is here. And for the next 500 miles, each man will ride alone, doing the thing he knows best, driving a precision racing machine to win. cars all together. On the surface, one pace lap looks like another, but close examination shows that the face of the 500 is changing. Only four of the starters are roadsters, two are novis, the rest are rear engine cars. As the pace car pulls into the pits, Jim Clark moves ahead on Foyt and pulls into the lead. drivers begin to settle down into driving patterns, which each individual man hopes will bring him into victory lane. Jim Herdeby's dream of finding the short way around ends on the very first lap. His transmission is out. Clark continues his lead. A.J. Foyt passes and moves to the front. Foyt tries to press his advantage, but Clark hangs on, determined to reclaim his lead. Clark recaptures the lead in the third lap. Foyt goes to second. short shoot, recovers in the infield, and drives on. Right behind him, Len Sutton loses control and spins in the identical spot, taking Dan Gurney with him. Both drivers recover. Gurney manages to hold on to third position. From the 18th to the 42nd line, five cars drop from the field. Dan Gurney is out with clutch trouble. A month of work gone. Clark continues to widen the gap. And A.J. Foyt has to stop thinking about being first. For Parnelly Jones engages him in a duel which completely takes his mind off the front running Clark. Clark gets the fuel sign and goes in on the 66th lap. The pit stop takes 17 seconds. Very short, considering that under a new ruling, fuel may be added by gravity flow tanks only. Floyd has the lead, but must soon make a pit stop. He tries to build up space between himself and Clark. Rookie Mario Andretti, in the pits on the 68th lap, desperately tries to get back to the race. He's running fourth and has been holding his own, matching the 150 mile an hour speed average set by the leaders. In the 75th lap, A.J. Foyt comes in. Another new ruling this year provides for two mandatory pit stops during the race. This does away with the dangerous practice of drivers carrying excessive fuel loads in an attempt to go the distance without stopping.
away and moves back into the lead. Voigt comes out of the pits and takes up his position, but he's now following both Clark and Connelly Jones. Andretti is right behind in fourth. At the halfway point, Clark leads. Voigt has regained second. But 16 laps later, Voigt pulls abruptly into the pits. His transmission has failed, and he's disgusted. This 1965 500 could have given him his third win, a record attained by only three men, Louis Meyer, Maury Rose, and Wilbur Shaw. Clark gets the word that Voigt is out. Some of the pressure is gone, but there is still Parnelli Jones to be reckoned with. In the 119th lap, Bud Tinglestad is running fifth behind Andretti. He loses a wheel and crashes the wall in turn number three. The wheel rolls into the infield. The caution light is on, and the race is slow. Tinglestad joins a growing list of 18 drivers who have gone out of the race. Taking advantage of the yellow flag, Connelly Jones makes his second pit stop. The engine coughs and almost dies, but springs to life as a relieved crew cheers him back into second position. The race roars on at 152 miles an hour average. The record book is being rewritten in this fastest 500. the 137th lap. He has a two-minute edge on Parnelli Jones. A comfortable margin, but there's still more than 60 laps left in the race. Twenty-four seconds later, he's on his way again. Walt Hanskin drives through the north infield with a blown engine. Now 21 of 33 starters are out of the race. On the 139th lap, Mario Andretti makes his second stop. He's running third. Mickey Rupp is fourth, and Gordon Johncock is fifth. Three rookies and two veterans lead the field. Thirty-nine seconds later, he's out of the pits, set to go the distance. At 150 laps, the speed average is 151.138 miles per hour, a new record for this changing 500. Finally, Jones makes a third pit stop in the 162nd lap. The crew really gets with it, for Andretti is coming up fast in third position. puts him back in the battle, but the elusive Clark is far ahead. Carrying a light fuel load, Connelly gambles on having enough to go the distance. This eliminates an all-out bid to catch Clark, who is two minutes ahead. Coming down to the end of the race is Clark, Jones, and Andretti, running together but traveling in different laps. Still holding his record-breaking pace, Jenny Clark crosses the finish line to become the victor of the 1965 Indianapolis 500. Cornelly Jones finishes a clean second. Runs out of fuel. He heads for home, pushing the car. And Jimmy Clark heads for victory lane and a winner's prize of more than $160,000. The fate of the front engine roadster is settled. The rear engine cars have completely revolutionized the racing picture since their introduction just five years ago.
Jimmy Clark of Scotland becomes the first foreign driver to win since 1916. And his Lotus Ford is the first foreign car to win since Wilbur Shaw's 1940 victory in a Maserati. for the first time in nearly 50 years, a non-American resident rolls a car in the victory lane here at the Speedway. Yes, he was the first foreign winner, actually, since uh, Dario Resta in 1916. And Resta was an Italian born, but uh, was an English citizen who was living in New York when he won. One other notable thing about this race, the crop of rookies, a yeah. lot of future winners there. Yes, in fact, one third of the field, uh, 11, were rookies, and it was a phenomenal group. Mario Andretti, uh, Al Unser, Gordon Johncock, Joe Leonard, Mastin Gregory, just a, an all-star cast there. Veritable who's who. Yeah. So uh, once again, 1965 Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Your winner is Jimmy Clark, and uh, it was indeed a classic. We're Donald Davidson. I'm Mike King. We hope you'll join us again next time for Indy 500. The classic.